Well, in the uh, in recent years, uh, a number of the uh, famous sixth to tenth century Scandinavian sites with uh, claims to uh, royal association uh, have been subject to comprehensive new uh, archaeological investigations, and um, most of these sites have obviously been known quite for some time, but primarily as uh, monumental sites. The new investigations have, uh, for large part, focused on uh, other aspects, such as uh, the residential aspects of these sites, uh, some of the workshop activities, uh, and also some of the assumed uh, ritual functions as we were just uh, discussing. In addition to these sites, also a number of other assumed elite residences, sometimes also uh, claimed to be potential uh, royal sites, have been excavated, and which also puts uh, the royal sites into a, a new context. And all of these uh, investigations have demonstrated um, stronger similarities between the sites than we uh, knew before, uh, and also some quite strong co uh, chronological correlations and uh, patterns between some of the sites. Um, as I was saying, my, my old work has primarily been on the, on the Yelling site, <coughs> and so a lesser extent also on Lyre. Um, but I thought with the theme of the workshop and, uh, and the context here, there might be an idea also to include some of the other sites. So I tried to assemble a, a brief overview of uh, Stand der Forschung on, uh, on some of these sites, uh, so I hope it will, won't be too familiar for, for you here. Uh, but I'll try to put an emphasis also on uh, on the architectural aspects. Okay, to do this manually. Uh, one of the sites which um, has seen quite intensive uh, investigations here recently is uh, Uppsala in the Mela region in Sweden, uh, which is obviously known as uh, the left uh, uh, residence of the Ynglinger uh, kin, uh, sort of one of the two main uh, royal lines in the Scandinavian region. Um, the new investigations have both uh, encompassed investigation in the central part of the uh, complex, uh, which uh, is dominated by the monumental mount, uh, of which, which dates back to the 6th uh, century, um, and also contains earlier cemeteries, both here and also to the east. Um, but there have also been quite extensive excavations uh, east of the complex in connection with uh, different rescue excavations. And the most recent overview has been published by uh, John Lundqvist and Pierre Frölund in a paper here from last year, uh, which draws up uh, the overall development of the complex. Um, in terms of the dating, um, there's some uncertainty as to the beginning of the elite elements in the Uppsala complex as it looks at the moment might extend back into the 5th century, um, but it's clearly most pronounced at the moment in the 7th and 8th, uh, uh, partly the 6th century also. Um, the investigations in the uh, central complex, uh, the most spectacular findings are large uh, hall building structures. Um, this one uh, is the most uh, well investigated and which is situated on a large uh, uh, artificially constructed plateau up to seven meters tall um, and with a hall structure which is uh, about 50 meters long and up to 12 meters wide at its uh, widest and which in terms of its internal organization uh, follows a pattern which seems to be relatively widespread in the Scandinavian area with some asymmetrical uh, or, or essentially placed uh, entrances uh, and some large hall rooms in the center of the building. Um, this seems to be the main entrance with double doors um, and um, so, uh, the building appears to have uh, been uh, burnt down. Uh, it's uh, reconstructed through several phases uh, but the burning is discussed as a potential uh, deliberate uh, demolishment of the building and perhaps also uh, associated with some uh, depositions of part of the uh, um, uh, contents of the building. Beyond this uh, main uh, hall structure, there are also other uh, large structures which have been discovered on other uh, plateaus and in the vicinity of the uh, main plateau. Uh, the function of these uh, are uh, it's open to discussion. It's been suggested that this might be a workshop uh, area. 
Um, and there are also new findings down in this area here which indicate that there might also be traces of further buildings. The rescue excavations in connection with uh, the railway construction has uncovered uh, parts of a, a very peculiar structure with extremely large posts with stone foundations set with quite large intervals uh, which can be followed over a, a length of uh, more than a kilometer up here and which also seems to have uh, other parts down in this area perhaps extending up here partly demonstrated by geophysics and which looks like it is uh, providing some form of uh, enclosure of part of the complex. Besides that, there are extensive traces of workshop activities also in the area uh, to the east. Another site which has seen uh, quite a number of new investigations and which has also just uh, been uh, published in a major monograph by Tom Christensen is uh, the Lyre complex which is then the legendary seat of the other of these main uh, um, uh, kingship families in the Scandinavian uh, area, the Skildings, um, and uh, situated centrally on uh, Sealand in uh, Denmark. It's uh, also characterized, as we just heard, by uh, monumentality, both in form of uh, older monuments dating back to both the Neolithic and the Bronze Age, but also with some new monuments being constructed uh, from the 6th century uh, with at least one great mount at that time and they then later in the Viking Age also with uh, four ship settings and uh, a cemetery um, which are found um, on the other side of a, a valley um, compared to uh, the new investigations of large residential complexes which are situated here and here on which, which seem to represent two uh, stages in the development of uh, a residential uh, site. The dates, um, are, and in addition to this, are also indications of uh, extensive workshop activities in the area down here, uh, uh, towards the later part of the uh, complex. Uh, it has been suggested that um, um, a number of de uh, metals detected find in the area to the uh, west represents different depositions and thereby are uh, evidence of the ritual activities which are assumed to also characterize these sites. Um, Lyre is uh, just as a point uh, uh, going back to the discussion about these uh, uh, potential hunting aspects of the site. It's situated in a kind of marginal position in the landscape between uh, uh, primarily agricultural landscape to the, uh, to the uh, east and then a uh, relatively uh, uh, or historically uh, forested area to the uh, west um, and which seems to have had very little uh, sort of agricultural exp uh, exploitation throughout uh, prehistory so it might fit into this model we talked about previously. If we take a closer look at um, the different parts of the complex. We have here the northern part, which is the oldest, dating back to the 6th century, which seems to be the establishment of the site, <coughs> uh, and which again has one of these relatively large hall structures. It's not terribly well preserved. And then there are traces of other uh, uh, secondary buildings uh, in association with uh, this main building. Um, there's a large uh, stone heap with different layers. Uh, of st uh, burnt stones and also containing some uh, artifacts in which resemble somewhat uh, uh, what uh, Gabor was also presenting at Liming um, and which has been suggested to have ritual functions but it's something which is uh, a bit open, uh, up for debate. The next phase the settlement moves uh, towards the south uh, and here we have a, a quite complex sequence um, which uh, Tom Christensen has uh, tried to uh, separate into different phases and it uh, looks like it starts with uh, a rectangular enclosure of the northern part, this part up here um, where a central placed hall building is erected on uh, a small promontory in the landscape uh, and which is associated with a number of uh, uh, inner enclosures 
uh, replacing each other and with also these special buildings within, resembling uh, the situation we, we just saw before here at the uh, Tissue. Uh, also with uh, some buildings along the uh, enclosure and potentially also some outside of it. Um, the main building is rebuilt several times on almost the same uh, location. It's uh, uh, about 50 meters long and um, uh, the roof supporting posts are dug more than two meters down into the uh, subsoil, so quite a substantial uh, structure. It's erected on a, a small plateau, nothing like the Uppsala one, but a, a small constructed plateau with a stone curb uh, set around it and also with some ramps leading up to the main entrance which appears to have been here and which would then have gained uh, allowed access into the main rooms in the building he down here. The last phase of, uh, of those uh, hall structures uh, bear evidence of a rather uh, uh, violent burning uh, and after that uh, destruction um, it looks like the area up here is largely abandoned uh, and the settlement moves down towards the south with the construction of a new large hall structure um, which is again rebuilt several times during the 9th to the 10th century uh, and also with uh, another large hall building associated close by uh, and some other uh, minor buildings uh, in the vicinity and apparently also enclosed by a large uh, palisade uh, around the complex. It is possible that the northern complex was still enclosed by a palisade and uh, the old ruins of the previous building or previous main hall appears to have been left and actually are at a later time reused for burials. Um, so it seems to be, form some form of a, a monument, a part of the historicity of the, the place even later on. On to another side, uh, I say I'm, I'm not going to say anything about Aversness, as uh, <laughs> Doug Finn is going to talk about that afterwards, but I'll just also mention uh, another Norwegian site which has seen some new investigations here recently. Uh, again, uh, firstly known from its uh, monumental appearance with uh, uh, ten great mounds, one of them uh, a cairn, um, and dating back uh, to around uh, 600 and uh, extending up to around 900 potentially with a burial up in the 10th century um, but uh, new investigations indicate that there are also uh, large buildings associated with this complex they're mainly documented from uh, geophysics so not much is known about them uh, yet then there's tissue as we already heard about um, <coughs> and uh, which I think has, um, yeah, it has also been proposed as a potential royal site uh, several times. But I think with the new evidence we see, it uh, perhaps stands out more through the very intense investigations which it has been subject to, rather than uh, the character of uh, of the architecture. Um, so I'm not sure I see it necessarily as a royal site, but definitely as a form of uh, elite residence. Um, it does, however, contain, uh, uh, through the intensive investigations, a very detailed insight into this type of elite residences uh, and which shows clear similarity also with the other sites. Uh, again, it consists of uh, two separate uh, uh, residence complexes, uh, the northern one uh, being the oldest uh, and then uh, the southern one here um, following after. And then there are extensive workshop activities uh, to the south, with also with uh, numerous uh, Grubenhäuser and um, then different activities on the uh, small elevation here, it looks a bit more dramatic than it is, um, has been suggested to reflect different uh, ritual activities, uh, among other things because of a no uh, number of uh, amulets, uh, sh uh, horse-shaped amulets and uh, ornaments. These are the two uh, faces uh, of the complex and we see a pattern which looks very similar to what we've seen before. The northern one, the oldest, uh, dating back to 
uh, perhaps the 6th century uh, with uh, the rectangular enclosure, a main hall building, an uh, inner enclosure connected with a, a minor building and a second um, uh, sort of hall architectural uh, building, uh, somewhat minor than the other. And in the next phase, which uh, where um, the complex has moved to the south, we see a similar pattern also with the Great Hall and the special enclosure as we was also shown in the previous presentation. So if we try to, uh, to uh, draw up some lines from these different sites, we can see that they do show some uh, very similar elements in that they have this combination of uh, uh, different aspects. They have the combination of the monuments, the burial monument, the residence buildings, uh, uh, workshop activities associated with most of the sites, uh, and also some uh, ritual uh, practices which um, has been suggested to reflect the uh, uh, form of centralization also of the, of the rituals. There's a very close correspondence as it looks at the moment between the architecture of the main buildings of these sites uh, large part of them seems to follow a almost fixed uh, template with this uh, ascent to the essentially placed uh, entrance rooms uh, next to the uh, main hall room and uh, uh, also with the main f uh, fireplace uh, situated there and then different functional rooms uh, towards the gables um, and also uh, at times with a location which indicates a very specific choreography in the, the uh, approach towards the house. There is, um, at least for the Danish examples, uh, a relatively clear and uniform spatial organization which can be generalized with this model here. They seem to also have this centrally placed hall building within a relatively rectangular enclosure. Um, there is often a secondary hall building uh, associated uh, uh, with the main building. Uh, found within uh, the central parts of the enclosure. Uh, quite a lot of them have this inner enclosure and also with a special building which has been suggested to be uh, ritual uh, in nature, um, even though part of the uh, evidence is actually an absence of evidence uh, that the empty areas in here are often quite empty. Uh, and then there are different storage and economy uh, buildings found along uh, the enclosure and workshop activities often associated with uh, Grubenhäuser found outside of the enclosure. When we look on the chronology, at the moment, uh, based on the available evidence, there seems to be a very strong correlation of the chronology of these uh, sites here. Uh, they start around 550 to 600, um, and all of them show a relatively uh, strong continuity not only in, uh, on a site level, but also on the individual main buildings, which are often renewed repeatedly on almost the same spot, and, uh, and in this way also demonstrates uh, the history of the complex. And this emphasized historicity of the places is probably also seen, in, uh, as we <coughs> also talked about, in the, in the strong uh, association with, the, with monuments, uh, both monuments constructed at the sites during their uh, lifespan, but also earlier monuments. Uh, and then it's also quite characteristic that uh, almost all of the buildings uh, have uh, destruction horizons, quite extensive destruction horizons, uh, which has led to different interpretations, both uh, it being a reflection of a, a form of ritual uh, renewal of the, of the main building um, or the, uh, uh, sort of coupling with the uh, ideas of conflict being focused on this uh, hall building itself with the uh, uh, burning of the halls as a representation of the destruction of, uh, of the elite inhabiting them. Compared to these sites, uh, Yelling is uh, somewhat of an anomaly. It uh, appears in a landscape in, in Jutland uh, without much uh, previous evidence of uh, elite uh, manifestations. And it's also quite late in the development of these sites and with a very short uh, duration. So it stands out from, uh, from the other places. It's, uh, as Uppsala and Leier 
uh, also one of the historically attested royal residences associated with the Yelling dynasty. Um, and this is also demonstrated by contemporary sources in the form of the rune stones uh, found outside the church today. Uh, the small rune stone here, its original position is unknown, uh, but it contains the inscription of uh, King Gorm the Old, who uh, raised it over uh, his wife, uh, Queen Tyr. And then there's a ra large rune stone where King Hal Bluetooth uh, proclaims his uh, uh, conquest of, uh, uh, of Danes and uh, also his uh, and Norway and also uh, his Christianization uh, of, uh, of the Danes. Um, so, the two uh, great mounds which are found in uh, um, Yelling uh, were subject to uh, uh, several investigations over the years. The most extensive of these were in uh, in the 1940s, <laughs> uh, and it's quite a yeah. There are some very spectacular images from the uh, photos from that event. It was actually excavated because there was a fear that the Germans would uh, initiate excavation, so they were <laughs> they, they started the project to get there in advance. Um, the northern mound contains a burial chamb uh, chamber which was uh, plundered uh, at a relatively early stage, but which uh, contains a few artifacts uh, belonging to the mid 10th uh, century and of a very high uh, quality. Uh, the, the southern mount uh, didn't have any uh, traces <coughs> of a burial uh, and seems to be have been erected uh, uh, either as a kenotaph or uh, for a different f uh, function as burial monument. But it covered uh, parts of a large uh, stone setting um, which was uh, relatively early on identified as a potential uh, ship setting um, and uh, which has also been reinterpreted in connection with the new investigations which uh, have been conducted here in recent years and which have been primarily focused on the areas uh, around the monuments uh, trying to uh, identify different activities in the immediate vicinity. And the results of these investigations um, uh, shown here, uh, it's basically revealed that the entire complex was uh, enclosed by a 360 by 360 meter large palisade structure um, with quite deeply uh, founded uh, posts. Uh, we expect that it has been about three meters tall um, and with some buildings uh, along the inside of the palisade uh, and Today, because of finds of stones up in the northern part here, we hypothesize that uh, the stones found underneath the South Mound might have been part of an almost 360 meter long ship setting which entirely enclosed the northern mound. These new finds also um, <coughs> draws the interpretation of previous finds under the church into question. Um, these uh, under the church a number of uh, uh, wooden buildings were uncovered which preceded the present church and they were originally thought to be predecessors of the church uh, but today with this structure as it appears it becomes a possibility that we are actually dealing with a, a form of central hall building. Just show a picture of the houses which we can see along the interior of the palisade uh, and you can see they are built according to a very standardized model which corresponds quite closely to the houses we find at Hell Bluetooth's uh, ring fortresses um, also with these uh, uh, appendices, uh, entrance rooms uh, in towards the uh, uh, main buildings and actually this type of architecture would normally be uh, a main house architecture in uh, rural settlements of the time but here they are found as secondary buildings. Here's uh, one of the early phases of uh, wooden buildings underneath the church and basically our inter interpretation is that we are seeing here uh, a part of, uh, of one of the great hall uh, architectural buildings uh, with entrances here and, and then you would have had the main room here in, uh, towards the west. 
such a sequence where a whole building uh, is replaced by a later church is actually known from uh, such a site as uh, Lisbia near Aarhus, uh, where traces of the whole building was found under the church in uh, connection with several excavations, and where, interestingly enough, also uh, a inner enclosure uh, outside the uh, or within the main enclosure of the uh, complex has been identified similar to what we've seen at Tissue uh, and uh, Lyra also, and which is also known from Jærestad, Eretsø and the Vorbasse settlement. And if this is actually sort of the model with this uh, special enclosure, inner enclosure and uh, special building, perhaps ritual, um, then it places the large room still yelling in an interesting position uh, just at the same or a, a symmetrical position to the other. When we look upon the chronological evidence of Yelling, um, we basically get uh, a picture where a lot is happening within a very short period of time. There's a rapid development in the entire complex. So uh, we have several stages in the construction of the North Mount and also several construction in the South Mount, uh, which covers the ship setting. Um, a relatively long sequence in the church area um, and then we have uh, the palisade complex with the houses uh, and we also uh, have some later stages uh, covering the, the face. And there are some different uh, absolute dating evidence both in terms of uh, radio carbon dates with those uh, uncertainties, some um, relative chronological uh, indications of type or typological dates uh, and a few dentochronological dates. And when this evidence is summarized, basically get a development where uh, most of the, the changes uh, occur within uh, a relatively short time span between 960 and 990. This is a stage before 960, um, where the earliest part of the monuments uh, are uh, drawn out, uh, which are basically the ship setting, uh, perhaps an inner stage of the North Mount with the chamber burial dated to 958-59 uh, and possibly in this phase also belongs uh, at the chamber, uh, chamber burial found within the church. In the next stage we get the large palisade enclosure um, and probably the whole building uh, should be associated with this phase also and the buildings found along the palisade. Um, already at this time the South Mount is constructed and in that way uh, basically uh, demolishes a part of, uh, of the ship setting. And this phase is uh, then chronologically the phase we associate with held Bluetooth um, and which is based on a very rigid geometry, uh, geometry and some very strict measures. So we have the 360 meter measure uh, on the palisade length. We have uh, an exact intersection of the diagonals over the uh, north mount uh, and we have uh, <coughs> 120 meter to the gable uh, and 60 meters between the gables of the houses. So there seems to be a very sort of strict uh, uh, symmetry and uh, uh, fixed meshes in uh, the layout, as we also know from, for instance, the ring fortresses. That face appears to have a very short duration. Uh, there are no indications of repairs of uh, any of the buildings, and there are traces of uh, burnings of both the central building and some of the uh, uh, secondary buildings along the uh, enclosure, and also the close enclosure itself. Um, so it seems the entire structure appears to be destroyed within a relatively short time after its uh, construction. And after that, um, the next buildings we find uh, basically have a completely different orientation than the buildings before. There's nothing to indicate that there are any traces of this massive structure in the following phases, which can be dated to the, um, the very end of the 10th century or the early 11th century. So to sum up, um, we have in Yelling a lack uh, of deep historical roots. Um, Yelling appears to emerge in a landscape without previous elite manifestations. Um, there is 
on the other hand, a very prominent use of a, what you could call sort of, sort of an older form of Scandinavian architecture, what we've seen at these other uh, royal residential sites, um, both expressed in the monuments and in the, and in the house architecture. Um, and I think it's relatively near at hand to, to see it as a form of uh, construction of history at, uh, at this site. Uh, and uh, in that way also as part of this legitimization of an assumed new form of, uh, of royal power. Um, but even though it clearly refers back to an earlier uh, architecture, it does so on a, a scale which is significantly larger than we've seen anywhere else previously. Uh, perhaps now with the exception of uh, Uppsala, uh, with the new findings there of the uh, enclosure. Um, and then finally it also has a very dramatic uh, closure with a possible destruction. Um, there was talk about just before here, um, uh, in the previous presentation, about uh, the uh, sort of uh, links also to the uh, Fals models, both the Carolingian and the Ottonian ones have been drawn into uh, the debate on the organization also of these uh, Scandinavian elite residences. Lars Jørgensen has suggested that uh, there is a similarity in some of the functional aspects that they both have the judicial aspects, the uh, ritual aspects, the, um, uh, some of the economic uh, centralized functions and uh, then also the, the, the military centralization around these sites. Uh, and Egon Bamas uh, has also suggested that there is in the choreography of some of the false uh, structures and in Yelling, for instance, a, a parallel uh, organization. Um, and uh, I think there might be something to, to begin from this on a, on a general level, but I also think that when we look at this, these sites, it becomes quite clear that uh, there is a very sort of well-defined and stable, somewhat uniform Scandinavian uh, architectural tradition, which is very different from what we see in the false architecture. It's uh, basically something very different. Um, and. For instance, if we compare to some of the Polish side, Ostrolinitsky, for instance, there you see a much stronger adaptation of the Faust models in, uh, in, in, these, uh, in the same period here than what you do in the Scandinavian pattern. So to me it seems like they are emphasizing here a very deliberate Scandinavian uh, language of architecture. Um, and this architecture clearly relies on a quite old tradition um, which is strongly normative because we can follow back uh, clearly into uh, Gudme, which we already talked about before, uh, but where new indications also, or new excavations also indicate that this was actually also this main part of the complex where we have the large 50 by 10 meter large hall structure here, uh, was originally partly uh, enclosed um, by some form of uh, fence or palisade. <coughs> we have the special uh, function buildings down here. Uh, we have a separate uh, secondary hall building up here. There's much of that structure which we see in the following centuries um, from the 6th century onwards which already seem to be well established when we are back into the late Roman Iron Age in the 3rd, 4th century um, AD. And indeed this model here shows clear similarities also with the general Iron Age farmstead. Uh, which has quite a lot of the same or, or, or the basic same spatial syntax of this uh, separation of uh, different types of buildings with the main farm building, the Mondstahl longhouse, uh, longhouse uh, situated centrally uh, on the enclosure at times with secondary buildings with separate uh, fireplace uh, and also with often a quite uh, extraordinary artifact material coming from these buildings and then with other functions, um, economy functions, storage functions along the uh, fences. And also in the Iron Age uh, or sort of the, the normal farmstead, the rural farmsteads, we already see this uh, continuity in the uh, longhouses with the replacement of the main building emerging in the fourth uh, century uh, where this kind of uh, 
uh, main house stability or historicity uh, seems to emerge. When we get into the uh, Viking Age, um, <clears throat> we, we also see a relatively complex uh, interplay between the rural settlements and the elite residences in terms of the architecture with elements from the elite residences going into the normal uh, agrarian settlements uh, and vice versa. So there appears to be a relatively uh, complex uh, situation uh, which probably also reflects some of the uh, dynamics of power uh, that, that these were not two really separate domains but something which was quite closely linked. So in this way, uh, architecturally, I think the elite residences comply with a form of general farmstead architecture. Um, they do so um, on a very different scale, and they also have associated clearly with quite different activities. Uh, it's a completely different find material we find on the sites. But I still think it's quite significant that there is a form of joint or symbiotic development where the basic spatial syntax of the elite and royal residences correspond with that of the farmsteads, uh, whose normative aspect stands as, as a sort of very extremely stable and, and uh, very strong normative structure throughout the first <coughs> millennium AD. Thank you very much.